Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. I'm Ryan Honeyman, a partner at Lyft Economy. My guest today is Charles Kahn. Charles is the co-founder of the life sciences venture firm Monograph Capital and was previously CEO of the Rhodes Trust in Oxford. He was also founding CEO of Ticketmaster City Search and a partner at McKinsey and Company. He's now the board chair of Patagonia and sits on the Nature Conservancy European Council. Charles, welcome to the show. It's really great to be here, Ryan. Thanks for having me. And so one of the main reasons you're on today is a new book called The Imperfectionist. And maybe even before we jump into like the details of that book, could you give folks a bit about your background and how you first got into the work you're doing today? Yeah, I mean, I started off in a pretty conventional way. I went to business school and after business school, went to work with McKinsey. And I loved the work that I did. But what I was trained in was a pretty conventional take on capitalism and what we called maximizing shareholder value. And it's a funny thing to say that now with all the sort of evolution of the world and how we think about it and my own personal evolution. So over time, I was also an entrepreneur and helped build some companies. And after doing that, I really went back to my roots, which is being an environmentalist and conservationist. I worked for years with the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation doing their environmental grant program and began became friends with Yvonne Chouinard and began working a bit with Patagonia and then later joined the board. So I've been on a bit of a personal journey to how I think about the purpose of business and where it sits in the environmental crisis and that whole nexus of things that we find ourselves in at the moment. Yeah. And how long have you been on the board at Patagonia? I've been, been on the board about 15 years. I've only been a chair for two or three years. And I, I should be clear. I mean, Yvonne Chouinard is the founder and the complete heart behind Patagonia. I'm a chair. A chair in Patagonia is a, an administrative fellow. Yvonne's yes. the, the <laughs> guiding light. Yeah, I joked with some other Patagonia guests. You have, you're contractually obligated to say like, Yvonne is really the one behind everything. <laughs> he would, sure. He's contractually obligated. He would never, <laughs> ever, he would never, ever say that. And I know. never said anything like that. But I think we all feel obligated to say it. Yeah. Right? At 84, he's just enormously vibrant yeah. driver of how we think about the world. And just when you think we've doubled and tripled down, he doubles and triples down again on purpose. Well, I'd love to jump into your book, The Imperfectionists, and start by explaining what the book is and why you wrote it. What was the process to coming to the feeling like we need this book in the world? Yeah, I'm really interested in the idea of human solving problems, which sounds like a kind of simple thing, but in some ways it maybe is the most profound and important thing. And in a world where we have you know, increasing importance to artificial intelligence, I think there's a really interesting question, which is what's the, what's the scope for human, especially given how many problems that we're facing? You know, and I think values-driven problem solving may be something that humans do uniquely better than machines. My co-author and I wrote a previous book called Bulletproof Problem Solving, which is a very toolsy book about how to solve complex problems creatively. In the depths of the pandemic, we realized that that under high uncertainty, like we were facing during the pandemic, problem solving takes on an even more important complexion because you need to solve problems very quickly in a world where your moorings are unclear. And it made us start thinking about problem solving and strategy in general, which is the old models for how you do problem solving, how you solve company strategy problems, assume sort of static industry structures. And, you know, people then think about structure and they think about the conduct of players, and then they develop strategies based on that. And I guess the reason we wrote the book is we think all that's out the window. When you have artificial intelligence, computational biology, and increasing disruption, faster and faster and faster. And there's lots of objective measures of this that we talk about in the book. That way of thinking about strategy as if it's a chess game is really out the window. 
And we wanted to write a book that would help people both in their personal lives and in the organizations that they serve, for profit or not for profit, feel confident that they can work together to crack difficult problems, even when it looks like the world's turned upside down. I love that. And you know, what are some of those common pitfalls that you see companies making perhaps now that they should think about sh- switching up? Well, companies and nonprofits, I think, fall into two. When things are changing quickly, they make two mistakes. The first is the most obvious one, which is you freeze. And you say, well, we'll, we'll change when, as soon as uh, things go back to normal or where things are stable again or we find equilibrium. And I guess the message of the book is there, there's no stasis coming that we can expect more change. And therefore, you better think about how to develop strategy now. The other pathology, which we see all the time too, is what I would call leap before you look. Things are changing so quickly, people make foolish decisions to leap into something. And of course, there's legions of examples of this. The, the one that comes to mind at the moment is Elon Musk purchasing Twitter without thinking really hard about what that was and who the communities were and what was important to them. And then now finding he's, you know, lost more than half the revenue and he's having to really rethink that. So either freezing or leaping before you look are are two pathologies in fast change that are not the best approaches to cracking strategic problems. And how would you describe sort of the imperfectionist mindset? And, you know, maybe we can go through some of the, those six strategic mindsets. How would you maybe compare those with lean startup and MVP and that sort of agile sort of mindset? Yeah. I mean, I think lean agile scrums and all that stuff, it's all, that's all good stuff. And going fast makes a ton of sense. A lot of that is essentially operational improvement, which is different from strategy. You are solving problems. So in in that sense, they're akin, they're, they're kin with each other. What we're talking more about is overall company direction rather than how to improve a particular process, but definitely in the same zip code. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So maybe could you mention some of the the problem solving mindsets and that imperfectionists sure. employ? Yeah. So I guess I'd start by saying, you know, when we think of Im- something that's imperfect, we think of it as flawed. And of course, what we're not trying to say is be flawed. But I think what we are trying to say is don't be afraid to make mistakes. That the best way to learn when things are changing quickly, the best way to learn the new rules of the game is to actually lean into it. And using relatively small, relatively low consequence moves initially, get the feedback you need from the external environment to make bigger moves more confidently, including building the skills and capabilities to do that. You don't do that by being frozen, and you don't do that by making big giant bet the company or bet the organization moves. And so most fundamentally, imperfectionism mindset says, don't be afraid to make mistakes and don't punish people in your organizations for making mistakes, as long as they're relatively low consequence and low cost. I do want to say that you probably thought a lot about this, but just naming it imperfection, there's like a relief, like a somatic relief of like, oh, it's not called the perfectionist, how Patagonia and Yvonne Chouinard crushed the world's comp. It's imperfection. And so it does seem like there's a, a big sem- like semantic importance of that. I think that's true. And I think it's definitely intended to free people up, to lean into risk in ways that are sensible. Yvonne is the ultimate experimentalist imperfectionist. You know, he said, and we quote him in the book, you can do a scientific approach to developing strategy and you can think it all through. And by the time you've done that, someone's already beat you to it. And he literally says the best approach is to take a step forward, see how it feels. And if it feels good, take another step forward. If it doesn't, step back and revise your strategy. It's a version of prototype get into the field, break it, go back to the bench, make it better, go back into the field. That's the loop that creates great gear and, of course, is behind Patagonia. Yeah, maybe you could speak a little bit more about Yvonne and, and Patagonia and why 
with your sort of intimate experience as being on the board and board chair, why does Patagonia have that imperfectionist mindset and why is it successful? Well, you know, it's not run by a bunch of people who went to business school. It's run by a bunch of people whose passion is to be out in nature and in the outdoors. And, you know, the, the mission of the company before 2018 was to make the best gear, do the least harm and use the harness, the power of business in order to fight the environmental crisis. So that's still in our blood, which is make the best gear while doing no unnecessary harm. That's the motivating force behind the company. Now, in 2018, Yvonne did one of those double downs and he said, actually, we're in business to save the home planet. So let's do all that other stuff, but let's make sure that everything we do makes a contribution toward actually saving the planet because we can't do business on a dead planet. And, you know, you can imagine when someone says that, you say, wow, that's incredibly inspiring. And then you go to work and you think, what the hell do I do? Hey, what is that? What is it? How do you operationalize that? And I think, you know, an interesting period of ferment where you stop and think, okay, is that just measuring our footprint? You know, the environmental impact, carbon generated, energy used, water used, or is it even more profound? And of course, you know, the answer is it's even more profound. And that capstone of that five years later was when Yvonne and his family gave all of their shares away to a charitable entity in order to fight the environmental crisis. Could you talk about that a little bit just in terms of, again, like using the imperfectionist framework, giving all your shares away <laughs> is a kind of look, maybe it's leap before you look, or I don't know. He clearly thought a lot about it before doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's also, I think, a message to all the people who, you know, signed the Gates Billionaires Pledge, right? Which is half. For those who, you know, who've been lucky enough to build great enterprises, what does your family really need? And maybe for those, you know, people who've created wealth partly based on the back of the planet, you know, we should use that creativity and those resources to make sure that there's, you know, a future for our children and for their children. And I don't, you know, the framework there is probably not an imperfectionist framework. It's probably a purpose framework. Right? Mm. And I think, you know, people talk about the purpose company nowadays, and I think that's a great thing. But I, I you know, I think Yvonne, there are probably others too, you know, Doug Tompkins and others who really started a long time ago developing purpose companies. Actually, it goes even back from there. If you go back and look at sites like the Lever Soap Company, which was founded in 1800s, those brothers, the Lever brothers, they had purpose all that time ago, right at the very origins of capitalism, right? This is and like so, pre, pre-Unilever? Is that, yeah, this, well, yeah. Unilever's what followed, but, and Unilever, by the way, was a pretty darn responsible company under Paul Polson and, you know, has done great things and had good financial results. And Yvonne will often say that, you know, we often contrast these things as if you either have purpose or you make money. And I think what Yvonne, Yvonne says is, when I do the right thing, it's usually good for business. And he believes that. Of course, he doesn't care much about quarterly or monthly profits. He cares about, you know, building the best gear, doing an unknown necessary harm. But it's a 50-year-old business that's been very successful over time because he does the right thing, not in spite of it. We started on some of the, the strategic mindsets. I'm curious, like Dragon's Fly Eye, Curiosity, maybe you could Reference, what are some examples either with Patagonia or other companies to kind of bring some of those home for folks who might yeah. be interested? Right. So we'll shift our head back to problem solving and and uh, and developing strategy. The, the six mindsets are curiosity, what we call dragonfly eye, seeing things from multiple perspectives, of current behavior, which is which really means what really happens. And so that's an experimentalist idea. Crowdsourcing intelligence. So one of the things that we think is many organizations are quite arrogant about assuming that the smartest people are kind of in their room. Using storytelling as a critical element of helping others decide to follow you and your strategies. And then the sort of overarching idea across all of that, which I described already, which is the mindset of imperfectionism, not waiting for perfect information or perfect knowledge or perfect capabilities in order to lean into those risks. So those are the kind of 
concepts. But I could give you an example or two for each one yeah. of those if it's helpful. Sure. So it sounds like an obvious and simple thing to say curiosity, but it's funny how as we get older as people and as companies become more successful, how anti-curious we are. You know, we get frustrated when kids ask 100 questions an hour or when it takes them a long time to tie a shoelace. But of course, that impulse to ask why is the impulse that helps you when things are changing quickly. And instead of imposing a pattern on them, oh, I've seen this before, we do X, is to actually stand back for a second and say, I wonder what's really going on here. That's the curious impulse. And so one of the examples I love the most is Edwin Land, who's the guy who invented the instant camera. And he was walking around Santa Fe, New Mexico with his daughter, who's called Jennifer. And um, he was taking pictures with his conventional film camera. And she said, Daddy, can I see the picture? And he knelt down and he started to explain to her that it was an emulsion, a chemical emulsion, and they're going to send it to the, take it to the drugstore and they'd send it to the lab. And and he caught himself and he realized like, oh, wow, her curious question sparked in him. Like, why can't we see the picture? And before they were done walking around Santa Fe, he had figured out in his mind an approach, an engineering approach, biochemical approach that became the instant camera. And so that impulse to ask the simple question, I think is just a beautiful thing. I mean, you can think of dozens of, of examples of that, that Nespresso coffee came out of this, whether you like those things or not, hopefully you recycle yours. But that came because a brilliant young engineer was in Rome and he noticed there was a big queue out one coffee shop door and there weren't any queues out the others. And so he wondered what the heck those guys are doing. And he went in and he saw this old barista uh, who was called Eugenio. He was pumping the machine because he thought the seals were broken. They weren't. But he was putting in extra pressure that created this thick, rich crema on the coffee. And that Eric Feb was the engineer's name. He thought, wonder, wonder what's going on there. And, you know, that impulse to be curious instead of thinking he knew everything there was to know about coffee. After all, he worked for Nestle and he was a rocket scientist. So I think the first idea is one is an impulse toward asking questions. The second one we call dragonfly eye, and that's the idea of seeing things through multiple perspectives. And again, before you, when you get older, you think you know everything. And so you start imposing patterns on things. And the dragonfly is yet is a cousin to this idea of curiosity, which says, before you assume you know the right perspective, try some perspective taking. So look at the problem, a strategic problem through the eyes of your supplier or your customer, or maybe through a disruptive entrant before you start using your pre-existing frame, especially if you're a successful company, to say, we know how to crack this. There's another example I love here, which is Invisalign, which are the clear plastic braces that have now turned orthodontia upside down. Did that come from an orthodontist? No, Probably not. <laughs> didn't. Orthodontists developed this uh, terrible metal technology a long time ago, and they stuck with it. They weren't curious about it. They didn't see it from different perspectives. Two young business school students were looking at it. One of them was wearing braces at 25 or 26 years old. They looked at it from the perspective of the user or the or the patient. You know, terrible. And by noticing that that his retainer actually moved his teeth if he hadn't put it in for a few days, they started to realize these two young business school students that maybe you could print literally 3D print a series of these that would move teeth slight, you know, ever so slightly, just like braces do, but would be clear from the perspective of the, you know, curbside appeal. And that's another one of these things where someone just looked at a problem through a different lens and they cracked it in a way that all the, you know, wonderfully trained orthodontists never never think about it. So those are just a couple of ways that, especially when things are changing quickly, you can stop yourself from doing something conventional and maybe do something remarkable. The third one is this idea of experimentalism. And I think nowadays we're used to hearing, oh, you should experiment. But I think most people think that just per pertains to, say, web businesses where you can do interface A and interface B and see who buys more stuff, right? But this idea of experimenting can go to almost any kind of business. And my favorite example here. Um, is, uh, is SpaceX. And, you know, whether you like Elon Musk or don't like Elon Musk, 
it's pretty remarkable what's happened with space or whether you believe in space travel at all, which is another conversation. But you had 60 or 70 years of NASA make very small improvements. And then in 15 years of SpaceX, all of a sudden, they go 95% down the cost curve so, so they can send a kilogram into space for a tiny fraction, 20th less than 20th of what it used to cost to send a kilogram into space 15 years ago. How do they do that? They experiment. They send 20 missions into space, 15 or 20 a year, instead of three or four a year. And they're not afraid to try new things like borrowing some heat shielding technology from the automotive industry instead of developing something just for this or creating a net that captures the nose cone, which is one of the expensive components so it can be reused. And most recently, you saw, I think it was called an unplanned disassembly, where they were launching a rocket into space that fell apart. But that was okay because they were testing 20 different things. Now, it also created a bit of substantial environmental mess. But the idea, I think, is still a sound one, which is not to be afraid to try things even and even have some things fail. And most companies are set up just to, to punish people when things don't work as planned. And at a place like Patagonia, we celebrate when people work really hard on something and then break it in the field because we learn something really important instead of having our customers learn that, right? When you when you do a high alpine kit, it better keep you warm, right? Better work. The fourth one that I want to talk about and then I'll, I'll finish up is the, the idea of crowdsourcing your intelligence. And it's a funny sort of thing to say, right? Because we all have clever colleagues that we work with. But a lot of times what's required to solve a problem creatively actually doesn't exist inside your organization. And not being afraid to use either crowdsourcing platforms or other forms of collective intelligence to bring that expertise in, in house. The example I love here is the Nature Conservancy, which is a conservation organization that was trying to crack the problem of how do you take these fishing fleets that are bobbing up and down in all kinds of water and they're bringing fish over the transom and they have to make a very fast decision. Is this an endangered species or is this a fish that's okay to keep? And they knew you could put cameras, video cameras on boats, but they didn't have any expertise internally on what you could do with that. And so they used Kaggle and they created a competition and they had thousands of entrants with a $150,000 prize, for $150,000, someone came up with a computer vision approach, a machine learning algorithm that quickly looks at the facial characteristics and thin characteristics of fish and makes a judgment and gives a green or a red indication to put that fish over the side or it's okay to keep it. The Nature Conservancy didn't have those folks internally. Why would they? But now you've got a cool technology that's helping to reduce overfishing rolling out through the fleet. So those are those I'll stop there for a second. That's four different mindsets that can help you solve difficult problems even when things are changing quickly. And I mean, I think a lot of people are waking up to the power. I mean, I feel AI has been around a long time. It's just we haven't seen it. It's been on the, you know, it's it's in Facebook's algorithm or it's in YouTube's algorithm. But now with obviously chat GPT and others, it's talking to you. I'm curious how do you, um yeah how do you how do you think about collective intelligence whether it's human collective or AI collective intelligence and like you know how do you determine is this I think you mentioned humans are maybe better value based decision makers did I hear you say that yeah and so you I guess did. how how <laughs> how would you think about those things well so. I don't think it's, you know, sometimes we're using simplistic tropes now, like evil, not evil. I don't think that's the way to think about this. But the chat GPT, as you know, through some of the people who have tried to break it, is capable of some, but they call them hallucinations. But of course, you know, that's a, that's a pretty silly term. It doesn't have a moral compass, right? And a, we can't count on AI to have a moral compass. We'd have to teach that. So one of the things that Rob, my co-author, and I are most interested in is the interaction of human intelligence and machine intelligence together. So you've probably heard of AI swarms, 
So this is the idea that you have multiple competing algorithms and people who are good at making decisions working together. And it turns out that that kind of human machine combination in competitive swarms actually does better predictions than either the AI alone or even really good forecasters alone. You may have read some of Philip Tetlock's books. He wrote a wonderful book called Super Forecasters, and it predates the rollout of most of this machine intelligence. But the idea of the humans interacting with the machines seems to lead to better outcomes. And that can be used for trivial things like predicting the outcome of soccer games, which it's damn good at, by the way, or much more profound things like coming up with di cancer diagnoses. It turns out that individual radiologists are way less good than a couple of radiologists with a swarm of machine learning algorithms all focused on the same biological data, right? So I don't know if that answered your question. I mean, I, I don't think we can abdicate the moral dimension. And I do think that there's an element of creativity in human problem solving that's very hard to mimic with the machine. Because creativity isn't just rapidly iterating, right? It's some, it's that inspiration idea where you see where you make jumps, and that's not how machine learning works. Right? May someday, yeah, not today. I'm curious is at Patagonia or is your team or the team um, like how does AI and, and Patagonia intersect, if at all? Is it sort of like we don't do anything with that? <laughs> Or is it something like, hey, we have to actually think about how to integrate this into what we do? That's the first thing I'd say is I think we're pretty cautious, um, partly because the moral dimension is incredibly important in Patagonia. And the human, when you're doing extreme outdoor, you know, athletic endeavors, we're not going to leave that to the potential for hallucinations. <laughs> but I do think it has a really important role in areas of our business like supply chain optimization and materials design, where maybe the AI will think of new chemistries that allow us to have, for example, water shedding fabrics that don't have the dangerous chemistries that we have today. You probably know that that best functioning Gore-Tex rain jacket that you have, that has forever chemicals in it, right? Gore, Gore has said that they're gonna get out of that pretty darn soon. Patagonia is uh, almost out of it and we all need to get out of those chemistries. Machine learning and artificial intelligence may play a role in developing the new fabrics, finding those new chemistries that aren't dangerous, but still help you keep dry. And maybe we could riff for a little on just the where you see this heading. So with the sort of political polarization and the way the climate yeah. has been going and how do you see the imperfectionist, you know, book and mindset like fitting in and how, how do you see it sort of like helping some of the current situation we're in? How do you see it solving all the problems? Of <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I actually spent a lot of time thinking about polarization because it, it vexes me that, you know, when I was a kid in the 60s and 70s, that it was, we had Republicans and Democrats then, but we also had the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and the Environmental Protection Act, NEPA, whatever that stands for. That was all developed via bipartisan legislation and in the Endangered Species Act. I mean, under Nixon, too. People don't know that. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So the most left Republican was left of the most right Democrat. We have very little overlap now. And I think the potential to solve big national and international global problems is really made so much harder by ideological polarization. And I don't mean to suggest that this book is part, you know, is a big part of the solution. I do think the ideas in the book are. So ideological entrenchment is the opposite of curiosity, right? It's the opposite of asking why. And when you see someone dug in a position that you don't understand, do you vilify them or do you go and you wonder why do they believe that? And I wonder if there's a way to bridge there, right? So the, one of the mindsets we didn't get to talk about, we call show and tell, which is how you use visuals and storytelling 
to actually convince other people to follow your strategy. And a lot of the thinking there actually comes out of this left-right stuff. And some of the thinking of, a, of an author called Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, who, wrote, who writes about polarization. And one of the things he says is to make sure to speak to people's hearts, not to just to what's in between their ears. That to speak to people's value systems when you're doing problem solving, not just to so-called facts. So I think, you know, in a world where people don't trust facts as much, if we could work together with curiosity, if we could see things from multiple perspectives, if we could be willing to engage in heart-based dialogue, values-based dialogue, I bet we'd be further along the path, right? I love it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know where I sit in all that stuff, and I know I wake up in the morning, and I read stuff, and I get angry, and then I try and stop myself and think, hold on. If you just make, if if you just other people, you're never going to work together. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm thinking of the the story of Patagonia under the tags, like vote the assholes out. That was <laughs> that was interesting it, one. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I, I love that. Let's use that example. Yeah. So first of all, was that corp, top level corporate strategy? Nope. It's a perfect example of what we need to be doing with strategy that we didn't talk about now, which mm. is. Strategic problem solving should be pushed down to the people who are actually interfacing with customers and materials and suppliers. Corporate strategy shouldn't just be done up top. The only stuff that should go up top, in fact, is when the consequences are huge or the resources required are huge. The rest of decisions need to be made down below and we should, we should support people when they make good decisions that don't work. Cause that's okay. We learned something. And that particular tag was just developed by someone way down in the organization who wanted to make that message. Now, did it say vote a particular party out? Didn't. <laughs> Didn't. Although you could guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's lots of assholes, uh, yeah, you know, for true. being honest about it. Yeah. And who was the person who loved that the most? That little tag. Maybe the president at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The chair, you know, the the found the founder of the company, Patagonia, was the person who loved that the most. Uh, ah. was Yvonne, who had no hand in it, he just thought it was the funniest thing he'd ever yeah. seen. I think that's a per it is actually a good example of this kind of approach to make to solving problems, which is push those things down yeah. in the organization. And you know what? You can correct. Like I think that's the thing that people don't realize, which is if you build a nimble organization, it comes back to some of the stuff you asked at the beginning. Correct course, correct course, right? If you have to push every decision up to the CEO, well, it's hard to correct course because that person could never make that many decisions. But if you actually really put power into people's hands and you trust them because you're guided by very simple values and, you know, Patagonia is guided by very simple values, you can trust people. And when they mess up, we just fix it. Just like, you know, think, prototype, break, try again. You know, I'm curious with Yvonne being, you know, 84, like you mentioned, and no longer owning the company, but very much still involved, I imagine, with every day, every day. How big is Patagonia dreaming? And like, what's what's the vision for the next 20 years? Well, so big is one of those funny words for us, right? Which is, you know, the family is not for growth. It doesn't mean it's always against growth. But our objective, none, none of our objectives say grow, right? None of the things I said. In fact, you could argue that being in business to save the home planet ought to be very, have a very suspicious attitude about growth. And that's 100% consistent with the family who are still you know, deeply engaged in this business. The, Maybe the it's clarifying that big meaning impact or like. I yeah. know, you know, I, yeah. think, I think that's good. I just, I, I say it because I think it's, for all those of us who yeah. care about rethinking, you could throw out capitalism, but so far the alternatives have been worse. So we got so right. So until we get a better answer, we got to fix it. Fixing it does require asking that question: Is actually growing necessary? So you know, we we grow when we think we make better stuff, um, and we're we're where demand is pulled rather than pushed. And in terms of impact, I mean, I think. Patagonia hopes to have massively more impact in our next 50 years than our first 50 years. 
And we didn't need to be a very big company to have a very big impact in how people think about capitalism. And I hope that only grows over time. So one of the big changes is people don't just say, how do you put purpose into your business? They say, that thing you did by putting all the shares into a trust on behalf of you know, the planet. Tell me about that again. Because it turns out it's pretty hard to have to have your a foundation own your shares, but we figure out a way to do it. And so now more and more companies are doing that and or people who own companies. And I'm not saying they were inspired by us, but even you know, a giant organization like Bloomberg has now committed all the flows from that company in the future to fight the to the aims of Michael Bloomberg, which are not the same as Yvonne Chouinard, but they don't need to be. We actually, the cool thing is we don't need to all have the same aims, right? But we do need to have aims. And, you know, just making money is not a good one. Yeah, I'm wondering if in the last 10 minutes or so, I want to get a little wonky on the like operation of the the purpose trust. Like, have you noticed, like what's one example of it working well and one example of it being like, oh, this is like way different and maybe a little frustrating (laughs) that it's this way? Oh, I mean, you know, it's we're a year in and it's still lots of learning because, you know, you could say on the one hand, what changed? You know, we all, we always were for making the best stuff and doing the least harm. And in the last five years, we've been for saving the whole planet. But it is a slightly different process to stop and think about every decision of if you were owned by the planet, which we are, what's the best thing to do? And I think it's it's it is it's both fun. And also a little bit frustrating because it's this, there's no oracle that can tell you exactly what's the right thing. The innovation's a good thing unless it hurts things and innovation that causes us to use less resources. That's a good thing. So mostly it's consistent. I would say it slowed decisions down a little bit because we're still feeling our way into how that looks. The board is very similar to what it was before. And I think we're working very well together. But it is like, you know, we are now thinking all the calculations also. So if you shrink the business, there's less surplus that gets distributed to fight the environmental crisis. So that's like one of the biggest trade-offs. We never had to think about that exactly before. And now we're thinking about that. We Indirectly, we did because, of course, the family gave away most of the money they ever made anyway to fight the environmental crisis. So. But this this puts a different frame on it, doesn't it? Right. And so I'd say you asked for sort of what made it, what's an easy and what's a hard. I'd say we're still feeling our way. And does it figure into individual product level decisions? Sure. Because what quality means, you know, has new has new weight. Of course, we're already pretty good at that. I think the place where it, the where the rubber meets the road is mostly these big strategic the thing we've been talking about here you know decisions and it's it's been both fun and humbling you're like you did i didn't know as board chair it'd be so hard to make decisions now. <laughs> but i well, decisions are always yeah decisions are it's, always it's almost never happened before really i mean not that it's no. never happened but it's very new so it's definitely feeling. yeah i mean as you know in europe there are foundation-owned yeah. companies and there have been for a long time some of that's a bit of a tax dodge, right? That's that's not all sort of purpose driven, right? This one's all purpose driven, and so there there may be analogs, but not that many. Well, Charles, in the last few one or two questions here, what do you need right now, and how can the listeners help you grow the next economy? Wow, I think that's a great question. I mean, you know, we need cadres of bright, committed, purpose-driven people who want to, who who can help crack what it would mean to develop a, you know a different economic order that still provides, you know, for good healthcare and education and all the things that humans value, but that also works in much better concert with the resources available on this planet. And if you don't mind me saying so, also takes account of all the other creatures that we share the planet with. I mean we're very, even in environmentalism, we're often human-centered, right? And we, we talk a lot about the impact on people. And I don't think we talk enough about the impact on species. You think about, you know, these poor little pikas and all the creatures that live right up at the very tops of mountains 
as things get warm, they've got nowhere to go. And, you know, you hear people say, well, you know, you're killing species in the Amazon. It might lead to better drugs later. Well, hey, it's not just about better drugs later. These are creatures. These are beings. And I think we, I, I, I hope, it's a longer answer than you wanted. I hope that there are cadres of people who are, that will help crack these problems. And, you know, I'll, I'll say it for you. People should check out your book, should buy your book, The Imperfections. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't go, I didn't go on your show to sell books, but mm-hmm. I, I, I hope these ideas are helpful to people as they try and crack difficult strategic problems in their organizations in times where I think it's just going to get more topsy-turvy. Right. And I do think, you know, you asked the question about polarization. I I hope we can find ways to build bridges to other folks, too. I really do. I'm optimistic. Good. I hope. I mean, but... you know, you're you're a little younger than me. I if we don't have optimism, we're really screwed. Yeah, this is a whole nother side story, but I have a, a conservative uncle that I reached out to and just did a lot yeah. of listening. And it was pretty fascinating. You know, right. he actually agreed on a number of things, even though he's a right. Trump supporter. So it's like, right. you know, he actually thinks the, uh, what is it? The Citizens United. He actually thinks that's a terrible decision. I was like, okay. And, you know, he thinks there should be mental health checks for guns. Anyways, I could go off, but I think there's actually a lot more agreement than we think. And there's fewer bad people than we think. Yes. Right. There's some uninformed people, but we but we shouldn't just think that it's other people. <laughs> yes. So, well, where can anyway. folks? Maybe could you list the name, the full name of the book, and like where folks can check sure. it out, and anything else you want to? Yeah. Out. So, so, so the book is called "The Imperfectionist: Strategic Mindsets for Uncertain Times." It's published by Wiley. You can check out excerpts from the book and um, podcasts and stuff that, that have been on the book on the site, which is the imperfectionist.org. And you can find the book at any online or physical bookstore. And I hope you enjoy it. Excellent. Well, Charles, thanks so much for coming on the show. And maybe I'll have you back on for your next book, if you think. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> I really love this spending the time together, Ryan. Have a great day. Next Economy Now is a production of Lift Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, Go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.